Established over 100 years ago, Watkins Books is one of the world's oldest and leading independent bookshops specializing in esoterica. We have the widest selection of esoteric books in the UK, and our friendly and knowledgeable staff are here to assist you in a unique ambience of our shop. So come and visit us in the heart of London as we're open every day. The Moore Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines. Available for download on all major digital platforms. The comments and views expressed on The More Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the view of Kevin Moore, The More Show, or this radio station and its affiliate or sponsors. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Broadcasting from the UK and across the world online, you're now watching the UK's only alternative late night talk show. And I'm your host, Kevin Moore. For the next hour, I'll be covering subjects that will open up your mind and provide you with information you may have never heard before. On today's show, I'm joined with my guest, young Martin Bang, who is a qualified permacultural designer and teacher. He was born in Oslo, Norway and grew up in England where he studied archaeology, geography, philosophy and agriculture. Now, he was active in the English cooperative and trade union movements in the 1970s. He has lived in Israel and worked and represented the Global Eco Village Network in Israel and helped build up the Israel Permacultural Group, teaching the first permacultural design courses in Hebrew. His work took him on extensive travels within the region, visiting eco villages and teaching courses in Egypt, Turkey, Cyprus, and the Palestine areas. Now in 2000 he moved to Norway and since 2008 has been a freelance permacultural designer, teacher and author. He joins us today to discuss his latest book, Permaculture, A Spiritual Approach. Young Martin Bang, welcome to the show. Thank you. Ah, this is, um, like, as I was just saying uh, off air there, uh, different from myself in, in one perspective, uh, permaculture, a spiritual approach. I think when the word spiritual approach came, I think that's when it came onto my desk. Um, um, just explain to the audience and myself then, if you can do, sort of to, to define permaculture. Yeah, well, this is something that I do a lot because I teach permaculture and people haven't really heard of the word, and they say, oh, what is permaculture? And uh, the simple explanation is that it's a, a design system based on using models from natural ecologies to design the infrastructure we need for a sustainable future. So if you take that in four steps, it's a way of thinking. Design is basically happens mostly in the head on, on bits of paper often. Um, that mostly comes out of thoughts, like how do you want to plan something? Um, when you do plan, you usually use some kind of a model, some kind of patterns, and permaculture is looking at the patterns that we find in nature because we know they work. Nature works really, really well. It doesn't actually need us that much. So we know we have good patterns that work, and we use those to create infrastructure, and that includes basically everything, from growing our food, to building our houses, to running TV shows, to setting up educational things, business, banking. Infrastructure is what keeps our human world going, and we need to design that well. And the truth is we haven't been doing such great design lately, as we know. And uh, but permaculture is used to create a sustainable future, something that really uh, is very much in the air right now. Um, we're realizing that we need better design to get out of those problems that we have, the climate change, ecology problems, social problems, economic problems. They keep promising us, promising us another 2008 soon. So, um, 
So we figure that if we can design well with human beings in mind, based on what, how nature uh, functions, we should get some pretty good results. And it shows. So, so could you define then what, what a, a permaculture establishment looks like? If, if something's been based on permaculture, it's not just green fields and, and um, um, back gardens. Um, obviously, it's, 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 this is more. It's a whole system. Uh, I think probably the things that um, illustrate permaculture best are um, eco-villages, of which there are tens of thousands around the world now, uh, where people try and put all the different elements together so that not only do you have you know, nice green fields and, um, and nice gardens and houses that are comfortable to live in that don't use up very much energy, but you also have economic systems. Um, actually, one of the things that's really growing now is uh, alternative currencies, or complementary currencies where people use their own money. Um, you have governance where people feel included, they don't feel trodden, trodden on. Um, and you also cultivate a cultural life which includes, in some cases, maybe meditation, maybe not. You don't have to have that. But often there is a side of things that is uh, appeals to what I would call the hidden dimension within us that most of us know is there. Uh, some of us give it very different names, but um, this book really addresses that hidden dimension uh, rather than the technical thing of how do we clean our wastewater and how do we grow our food without using too many chemicals. Okay, okay, and but okay, I'm kind of getting it. Um, obviously, this is this is this is kind of new new to me. I I, I had a set sort of def definitive uh, idea what it was, but it's it's not that I, I I'm I'm getting now. Um, okay, uh, you want the snappy definitions? Uh, the snappy definitions are things like permaculture is a dialogue with nature. In other words, we do something, we observe, listen, uh, look at what the reaction of nature is, how, you know, do we, we grow a plant? Ah, oh, it's looking really dry. We need to water it. You water it, it looks better. You have a dialogue with nature. That's a dialogue seeing what happens. Uh, it can also be called ecological literacy, something which we think, uh, we see that people who live very close to nature, they understand nature. They know when various things are ready to eat and what kind of things you can eat. Um, they watch how you know, birds and animals behave and they say, ah, I see you know, things are going to happen with the weather. Uh, they have a, a, an ecological literacy which we have to a certain extent lost because we moved away from nature. Um, you can also say that permaculture is common sense. I like to, um, I like to introduce uh, the Chinese definition of permaculture, which is the study of simple things. And you know that old thing about common sense isn't so common anymore. Um, so common sense things like, for instance, it's actually quite good to eat food that's grown locally. It means it's common sense. It means less transport, fresher food, food that is grown in your climate, which is probably um, all other things being equal better for you than the stuff that's grown in other climates. Uh, that doesn't mean you only can eat the stuff that's grown in your backyard. But if you base your, um, your diet on stuff that's grown locally, you, it's common sense. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to me when I go to the supermarket and I see potatoes from Argentina and I'm wondering, what's the story here? Um, so those are the kind of definitions that are easier to, to uh, hang on to. And I also have to add that permaculture, two things are really important here. Permaculture is a response. It's not like somebody said, ah, um, I've invented a new religion. It's not that at all. It's a response to a world which we see 
is getting increasingly polluted and is increasingly fraught with problems. And so it's saying, well, how do we solve these problems? Uh, I sometimes use the word trauma culture, like we have a trauma culture that's uh, traumatized by social things, by pollution, and so on. And so it's from trauma culture to permaculture. And the other thing that's really important is that it's not either a panacea or the only way. No, 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 absolutely. But uh, this is the, this latest book of yours, Permaculture, a spiritual approach. Um, why this? Why the spiritual approach? Right. Um, permaculture started off in the seventies and really gained a footing in the eighties and was very much concerned with technical solutions. Uh, originally, much more about agriculture. It was actually came from the words permanent agriculture. Very much, uh, how do we do the things we need to do? And it was concerned with uh, growing food, building houses, treating water, storing water, treating the wastewater, and that sort of stuff. It has very good definitions of things like uh, waste. Actually, there isn't such a thing. Waste is the definition we give it. We say, no, there's no such thing as waste. It's resources looking for a use. So you have a resource, you've got to find a use for it. There's no out there where you can throw it away. A way doesn't exist. A way is on this planet. And it very much became a technical thing. There, when permaculture started being used in a community context of building eco-villages, which really happened in the beginning of the 90s, it was clearly seen that there's another dimension here, which is how do people work together, which is not so technical. And so a lot of people became concerned with how do we get that special feeling, which we all know, we all recognize it. We call it chemistry between people. It's actually not chemistry at all. It's nothing to do with chemicals. It's how do we work together? How do we relate to each other? How do, if you don't like somebody, can you still find a way to work with that person? And a lot more spirituality came in because we found that there are many, many spiritual traditions which address just that issue. And within permaculture, there arose a debate between those who wanted more spirituality and those who wanted less. And this book came about because we realized that the idea of the scientific materialist reductionist world that we've grown up with, that I grew up with, that was current in the mid uh, 20th century, has given way to a world that recognizes there is something else out there. And we, Craig and I, realize that we have to address that. We can't pretend we're not, that the world doesn't have a spiritual dimension. Uh, when you design something, you need to design in so that people feel good. It's not just the, you know, the water has to be clean. There is something else in it, it has to feel good. And there are more and more questions popping up in science now saying, well, actually, you know, why does water behave the way it does? It actually doesn't behave like anything else we know. Totally unanswered un questions. Questions like, how come water seems to have some kind of memory? And you mention that to some people, they say, well, that's rubbish. You know, water is just water. You say, yeah, but it behaves differently from other things. What is that? And this is not an easily definable um, uh, materialist thing. And so we, we decided to uh, put this book together to address this issue because permaculture is really now pretty much global um, and it's multicultural. And certainly both of us have realized that we are teaching people, some people who are very materialist, but a lot of people who are not materialist at all, they're deeply spiritual. And we need to have a dialogue. We don't need to 
uh, missionarize anybody, but you have to be able to have a, um, a conversation that's understandable. Yeah. Do you think you had that conversation when, when, when spending time in Israel then? Because obviously you taught permaculture in Israel, um, and obviously that's a, a pretty divided country with its neighbors. Um, what was your experience like over there when embracing permaculture? Um, very, very interesting because you have, you know, you would have a group there of 20 people maybe in a class where you would have quite orthodox Jewish people, you might have some Christians, you might have people who don't really have any particular religious bent at all but define themselves as Jewish, or they define themselves as Muslims but really don't particularly go. You might have some quite hardline Muslims there, some Muslim uh, you know, mystics and so on. And so it's really a multicultural thing and um, you really need to be able to tread a thin line but at the same time appeal to all of the people. Um, but actually, I'll tell you, the, the, one of the um, aha experiences I had was in India uh, just about a year ago uh, when I was traveling and I visited an agricultural university there. And we had a conversation about permaculture, and it was kind of like a kind of like a surface conversation. It was interesting. It was friendly, um, but kind of like collegial, if you want to use that word. But they kept mentioning yogic agriculture, which I'd never heard of. So I said, I said, you know, okay, just tell me what this yogic agriculture is. And these were professors, right? It was, you know, not, not hippies. And they said, oh, it's uh, agriculture where, you know, you do meditations and you say mantras and you um, pray over the seeds. And I said, oh, that's interesting. That's, you wouldn't hear that in a, in a university in Europe. Um, I said, we have something similar called biodynamics in, uh, in Europe and in other parts of the world. And they said, yes, 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 of course, it's the same thing, you know. Um, yogic agriculture is the Indian version of biodynamics and suddenly the whole tone changed like they became interested in permaculture they became interested they knew about biodynamics and it changed from being a surface conversation to suddenly becoming a deep conversation and I realized that yeah if I just said well you know we don't do that kind of stuff we just you know clean water and make compost piles, it would have stayed at that level. But the moment we touched on a subject which we both uh, knew was important, uh, the whole thing changed. And I realized, yes, we have to be able to talk to these people. If they, all they want to find out about is how to insulate your house better and how to get you know, energy from the sun, that's fine. I have no problem with that whatsoever. But the moment that something... Um, gets to a deeper level, uh, it's important to be able to have that conversation. Yeah, yeah, ab 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 absolutely. And, and, and currently, um, you, you know, you're based in, uh, I think the introduction said that you're based in Norway still. Um, that's, your, that's your home right now, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Right. I am uh, Norwegian, so it's... You, you, so, oh, you, sorry, yes, because of course you're born <laughs> Norwegian, but that's so, right. Very humbly. In fact, I don't know if you can see anything out the window, but... Um, it's a beautiful day of minus seven today with snow-covered mountains in the background. And they promise us minus ten tomorrow. <laughs> well, exceptionally um, cold compared to where I am right now, I guess. But I guess you're, you're very used to it. But, you know, you, grew, you, know, you, you spent time in London and, um, um, you know, you studied uh, many different subjects when you was um, over in England. What, what really drew you to permaculture? Um... I guess it was the a red thread that's run through my life uh, when I really, yeah, from the 60s, an interest, it's a response, an interest in alternatives to a world which in the 60s was kind of like, there was a lot of Vietnam War going on, there was a lot of stuff about the bomb, 
uh, there was a lot of stuff about unemployment. And I realized, you know what, that's not exactly what, you know, I signed on for on this planet. Um, I want other stuff. And yeah. the whole thing about alternatives throughout the 70s, for me, um, became an interest in uh, what they call alternative technology, solar energy, wind energy, that kind of stuff. It turned into growing food organically. Um, it it uh, came into uh, alternative types of medicine and alternative ways of living, communal living. And so all those things were part of my life in those days, uh, which actually was what brought me to Israel because I wanted to live in a, in a community that was an alternative community. And the kibbutz was a really alternative community, not in the kind of 60s hippie style at all, but it was a community which had a completely different kind of um, economics, um, completely different kind of decision-making stuff, and so on and so on. Um, and I picked up a book on permaculture in the early 80s, and I thought, oh, this looks interesting, yeah, stuff that I can do. It's like designing good systems. And never really did much with it because there are many different systems out there. And, um, and then during the 80s, I kind of noticed it was becoming more and more of a... It was growing, growing internationally. And then in the early 90s, I was given the opportunity to um, basically take permaculture to Israel which it hadn't really, not much had happened. There had been a few seminars, a little bit of stuff was happening here and there. And there was a grant out to, uh, actually they were looking for somebody in the kibbutz movement to look if they, that kibbutz movement could be an eco-village type movement. Uh, and I was working in ecology in the kibbutz movement at that point. And the movement is big. It's uh, 150,000 people, 270 villages, throughout the country, it's, it's big time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when I did that first foundation course, which is a two-week course, everything seemed to fall into place in terms of, ah, now I understand how wastewater treatment relates to how we feel about each other in the community, how that relates to how you take responsibility for things. It all seemed to fit together so well. And I realized that, yeah, what I want to do is to teach this as a foundation course. And so I worked for a few years, learning permaculture, doing permaculture. And I still think the foundation course is a tremendous invention. As uh, somebody said in the course recently, actually, it's not about technical ecology it's about lifestyle design and when you design your lifestyle it doesn't matter where you live when you design your lifestyle to be more ecological you have to learn these things and so you do it on the way um absolutely it still fits perfectly with me i think you know i i teach it to people, and I see the changes it makes in their lives. Yes, yes, ab absolutely. And, and th there is one um, founding uh, permaculture uh, community in Scotland, and basically it was, I think it was uh, founded in the 1960s, the, the Finhorn community. Yeah, uh, but Finhorn, the Finhorn community, uh, tell us about that, that community and, and, and why that's a sort of um, uh, a, a spiritual approach to, 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 to uh, permaculture as well, in your opinion. Well, Findhorn was the kind of archetypal hippie community of the 60s, actually founded by three people who were far from that. Uh, they were deeply Christian um, and very spiritual. And uh, they began by just listening to what messages God was giving them to do. And they really had nothing. And they 
started implementing. They said, okay, you know, the spirits are telling us to work together with plants and grow vegetables, and they grew vegetables. And then they attracted other people because the 60s was a time of tremendous searching for something new. And people went to Findhorn because they heard there was something going on there that was spiritual and practical at the same time. And the community grew not as a design, it grew organically out of spiritual practice, meditation, singing, and doing things. Um, became actually quite an important place. People started going there to learn. And even in the early 80s, I would say, I, re I never went there then, but I realized it had the kind of description that I would say it was a bit like an alternative university. People would go and live there for two, three, four, five, ten years, and then they would go off and start something new. And it seemed that they started a lot of things around the world. They call it the, uh, the network of light, which is different communities around the world doing similar things. Very into education. Uh, I got the opportunity to go there the first time to an eco-village conference in 1995. And I met Craig then. And a few years later, he came to Israel to visit and do some seminar work there. And it turned out that I went back to Findhorn for conferences and for meetings from time to time. And Craig was a permaculture teacher and I was a permaculture teacher. And you know what it's like, you know, you're a TV interviewer. When you meet other TV interviews, you hang out and you say, how's, how's life? <laughs> and we used to hang out and say, you know, how's permaculture doing? And I was at his house a few years ago and I said something like, uh, you know, Craig, you should write a book about uh, permaculture here at Findhorn. And he said, oh, no, no, I can't, I don't write, you know, I'm not a writer. And I was going back to my, where I was living uh, staying at the community and halfway there I realized wow we do it together I ran back to his house I said Craig we can write the book together I can write I don't know anything about permaculture at Findhorn you can't write you know all about permaculture at Findhorn it's a marriage made in heaven and he said yeah let's do it and so we worked together for two or three years and it was a learning process for me to see how all those different aspects of permaculture were being worked out at Findhorn and how they were meshed together with the spiritual practices there. And for him, I think it was, a, he said, look, it's the only thing I ever wrote. <laughs> and, uh, he, he really, we've done some seminars together and it's been great having that headspace together. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, okay, I think we've just put some pictures of the, the Finhorn uh, community on, on, on the screen there as well. Uh, it's, it's a very beautiful place. Yeah, I think uh, the aesthetics are really, really important. Uh, people often say that a lot of permaculture projects are really untidy and kind of uh, messy, and uh, there is that aspect to it. Um, which we do sometimes in our modern Western world have the same attitude to nature. It's kind of like untidy out there, you know, there's all those animals running about and they really would be good to, you know, get it tidied up a bit. Whereas in fact, nature works by being a bit untidy. Um, and I think Findhorn managed to, to tread that line between things being messy and untidy and being aesthetic at the same time. Mm, mm. Uh, so Can, there's really, really great examples of gates. Gates of Findhorn are tremendous. You know, it's, uh... can, can anybody come to Findhorn to live? Or is it um, a, bit, uh, a bit more difficult than that? Um, yeah, they're building houses there all the time. So they're, they're very open to people coming to live there. Um, I think you would find it uncomfortable if you weren't sharing some kind of a spiritual dimension, um, which often comes down to trying to um, 
play down the ego. Like it's not really such a comfortable place for people who are out for themselves uh, at the expense of others because you would be confronted by the others saying, hey, you know what, that's not very, that doesn't work very well here. Um, also, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think why would anybody want to live there if they're not interested in, you know, some kind of spiritual cultural quest and some kind of living closer to nature and in harmony with yeah, with nature and other people. Um, it's not actually that. It's not so beautiful actually. Uh, it looks beautiful, but it's a you know it's a little flat. And the soil is kind of sand, and the wind blows off the North Sea quite severely <laughs> a lot of the time. Um, so it's it's not. Well, uh, you know, there's other yeah. places that are much more beautiful, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I was just you know beautiful for a permaculture settlement, shall we shall we, shall we say, um, in, in, in that respect. Well, from what I saw, it, it, it looked nice, but yeah, um, obviously you know you've got to be coming from the right space to, to move there. And is there? And obviously, there's many other permaculture set settlements settlements uh, nowadays as well you know is it permaculture would you say it's embraced uh, in the u.s nowadays as well yeah oh yeah permaculture is definitely very international um i have a more more of a european perspective i've only been to the states a couple of times and i haven't really got a handle on everything that's going on there um, but there is a magazine called, uh, I think it's called the Permaculture Activist, but it just changed its name to something like Permaculture Design, I think. That's uh, one there. Um, in Britain, there's a very interesting project in the Permaculture Association called the Land Project, L-A-N-D, um, which is basically a network of permaculture design sites where permaculture is being practiced in a good way. There's some kind of quality control over this. Um, and it's being practiced and taught. And I don't remember how many they have now. It's, it's quite a lot of centers in the tens or if, in the dozens. I think it was the last a couple of years ago, they clocked in over 30,000 visitors. So... You know, that's it's numbers beginning to to show here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, well, well let's get into um, yeah, the, the the book as well as much as we can do. I mean, I know we're, we're sort of skirting around um, to, to 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 bring the you know the, the idea of what permaculture and and its implications in society is, but obviously that's it mentioned a, a lot in the book in the different chapters. Just off air, we talked about three core principles of, of the book, which was earth care, people care, and fair share. Um, now, obviously, there's about, I think, is there about nine chapters in this book? Uh, there are 12 chapters altogether. 12 chapters altogether, so yeah. The, 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 those three things, um, earth care, people care, and fair share, are often defined as the ethics of permaculture. Um, and, you know, things need to have an ethic to be this kind of... Um, founded on something more serious than just screwdrivers and hammers, you know. So, um, and I think it's important to have an ethical base also to see that, you know, there's, it's more than just technical stuff. And, of course, um, these things are not in order of priority or one is more important than the other. I like to use this image of the three-legged stool, but, you know, one leg is not more important than the other. You take a leg away and the stool does, doesn't function anymore, basically. So earth care is the technical side. It's building the houses. It's uh, you know, growing the food and so on, energy. Uh, people care is really, really important because we know there is something that happens when people get together. Uh, you can call it community, you can call it fellowship. Um, there is a feeling, I always say to my groups that, you know, after a few hours of having uh, worked in permaculture in a, with a group, 
I say, look, had we been waiting in a doctor's waiting room for the last three hours, it would be a very different feeling in this room than the feeling that we've generated by interacting with each other in a, in a good way. Um, and people care is about people is about getting people to feel comfortable with each other and interacting well. So, like one of the exercises I do at the beginning of every course is that I ask people to write down without signing the paper uh, something that they're anxious about the group or the course. It's a two-week course, so you've got plenty of time to be anxious, you know. And we collect those together, and then we go through them, but there's no names here. People just write, you know, I'm anxious, I don't speak English very well, and so on. Uh, I'm anxious because maybe, you know, people will laugh at me when I, I uh, don't know something. And so we go through those things, and we say, well, what can we, what positive thing can we say as a, as a guideline which would help this person who feels uncomfortable about their lack of English, uh, help them in that situation to feel better. And we come up with a set of guidelines, we write them up, we put them on the wall. We say, those are our guidelines for the course, because we're here to look after each other. It's people care. Um, and fair share is because we, we're not the only ones living on this planet, and it's not just a few of us who are the only ones living on this planet. You know, we Westerners, we share it with, you know, a lot of other people. Um, we're both white, you know, we share it with a lot of different colored people. Uh, and we human beings, we share it with a lot of different animals and plants. And those are our fellow passengers on this planet. And we need to be able to have a good time together. And the best way to do that is to share things fairly between us. And we see that the two things that really make a difference, sharing, food and power, are not fair, shared very fairly around the planet. And so let's come up with designs that um, makes that sharing better so that people don't feel poor on the one hand, and rich on the other. And actually, it seems to turn out that either way, either side of that divide you are, you're feeling bad about it. Most people, anyway. Well, you, you know, it's funny, you, you know, because um, absolutely, there, there is, you know, there is, there is enough, yet, um, you know, to, to those suffering right now, there's, there, there, is, there, there is to them a, 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 a lack of... Or, or, or um, uh, you know, it, it, uh, the, the suffering as well, and all sorts of issues uh, going on um, in the world right now. And I know, really, a lot of us, what we, you know, in this spiritual ide ideology, in a sense that you know, we we try to make a difference in our lives now, in in where we are now, because that's what's in our reality right now. But that shouldn't ignore the suffering of others. It's 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 a it's a it's a it's an ongoing process with me just trying to figure this all out sometimes um but for those living ab 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 abroad or for, for for those living in 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 places where you know there is a lack of how would permaculture you know it would it would take more than one to bring a permaculture society together i mean i suppose it's not even even in people's ideology is it the the idea of permaculture in in that in that sense you know in, in a refugee camp who's going to embrace it? permaculture hasn't it got to come from other people to give, not to not to give Un, 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 unscrupulously but to to make some changes somewhere I don't know well uh, there are two things that actually are quite fundamental to permaculture one is that it's action oriented so even though uh, you know we're pushing a more spiritual side and, and there is a definitely a meditative and a philosophical side and the ethical side it's action oriented so it's like get out there and do something um, but there's also another thing about taking responsibility um, and not doing what you can't do. In fact, it's kind of like common sense that what's the point of doing something you can't do? So I, you know, in my more 
kind of down moments may be, I'm concerned that the Chinese want so many more cars because it's something that's not good for the planet, especially if they're petroled cars. But there's nothing I can do about it, actually. So I, you know, I say, okay, I, I'll worry about that another time. You know, it's uh, when I want to feel bad, I can worry about that one. Um, but what are the things I can do? And everybody can do something. And taking responsibility and doing what you can do is actually very empowering. And, you know, people say to me, well, you know, the world's so terrible, there's nothing I can do, what can I do? And I said, well, did you join the Permaculture Association? I said, it only cost you, you know, I don't know how much it is in English, maybe 30 quid or something a year, which in Norway is not very much. And they say, oh, no, I didn't join that yet. I say, well, that's something you can do. That's, uh, that's a concrete step, you know, it's something. And then you will find yourself in a situation where you'll meet more people and, and uh, get invited to stuff, and actions come out of that. Um, you know, people say, oh, you know, I live in a flat in town, there's nothing I can do. And I say, well, you probably have a windowsill, why don't you grow some herbs on it? Um, you know, that'll make you feel good. Herbs are good. They, you can grow them for tea and whatever. Uh, why don't you talk to the other people in your apartment? Maybe you can um, uh, find a piece of land and grow some vegetables on it. Maybe you can share babysitting between the people in the, in the um, flat, in the flats in the, in the building. Uh, there's always something you could do. Um, I try quite consciously to buy as much as I can uh, food that's organically grown because I would like to see more organically grown food. Um, some people complain it's more expensive. I don't know if my total bill for food is any higher than anybody else's, um, but we do have that thing about growing, you know, buying organic food. There are lots and lots of things you can do. Uh, I try and take uh, collective transport rather than drive my own car. I can't always do that, but I try. So there's always something you can do. And I think it's very, very important to do something and feel good about it. Which I guess is one reason why uh, this guy on the course uh, a few weeks ago said, ah, it's a lifestyle design course. It's designing how we can live better. And I think the word better is, it's not best, it's not ultimate and it's not something that's going to take over the world either. It's something that just would help people align their lives a little bit more with an uh, ecological uh, focus. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, okay, so it's more than gardening and farming. It's 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 more than water. It's it's more than house and materials and design and building. It's it's all these things together. It's not just one. It's 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 a whole collective of common sense stuff, and um, uh, as as your chapters cover, there's one chapter at the end where you where you talk about um, spaceship Earth and the the sort of is this a sort of the, the, where we're heading to in a sense, or what what what's the potential future for us with permaculture? The whole idea of Spaceship Earth is part of that 1960s thing. Um, there was actually, you know, the moment they brought back those first photographs of the, of the Earth taken from outside the Earth was like a major uh, happening in our consciousness. We saw it as one whole Earth and in the USA, there was something called the Whole Earth Catalog. This was, you know, before Google was even a flash in somebody's eye. This was um, a long time ago, in the mid to late 60s. The Whole Earth Catalog was putting everything together. And um, it was Buckminster Fuller, who was an American designer, who designed geodesic domes and uh, very active in the 40s, no, 50s and 60s. He wrote a book called Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. And he had a very global take on the whole thing. I think today the idea of one 
earth is actually much more common. People are aware of what's going on in other places. We are tied together. I mean, just look at what's happening right now. I'm sitting in a small village in Norway talking to you instantly, instantaneously, somewhere in England. I don't know where you are in England, actually. That's interesting, isn't it? I don't know where you are in England. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which town Cleth are you in? Cleethorpes. Cleethorpes. Ah, yeah, that's, that's so interesting. I lived in Lincolnshire for a long time. Oh, right, okay, what part? Uh, in, near, near Louth, actually between Louth oh, and my Lincoln, gosh. up on the Wolds. Louth and Lincoln, yes, and I know it very well. Yep, yep. <laughs> Hainton, actually. So, you know, that's, you could have been anywhere in Great Britain, actually, is the truth. Um, and we're talking about global stuff, and I'm telling you stories about India and mentioning the USA, and I'm sure you have people on your program from all over the world. We're totally global. I listened to the news this morning about Syria. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a one earth. And there, there was a great headline in The Guardian a few weeks ago after the, the Paris um, climate talks, which said, there is no planet B. In other words, this is the planet we've got. I mean, okay, so we can send half a dozen people to Mars on a one-shot one mission, but, you know, it's not relevant, actually. It's probably fun if they want to do that. But this is the planet we've got. This is the planet that we have to deal with. And uh, whatever, I mean, if you're a Christian, you know, in, in that tradition, we are the stewards of the Earth. Well, we're not doing such a great job, actually. You know, we could do better. And so the, the consciousness of seeing this as one planet is very, very helpful. Uh, there's that whole thing about if the planet Earth was a ship with 100 um, passengers, there's these statistics about, you know, half a dozen would be starving somewhere down the hold with nothing, you know. They wouldn't even get water to drink regularly. Well, that's not very good. We could do better than that. And the whole thing with the refugees right now, you know, like um, we actually have, we're throwing away so much food in this, on this continent of Europe right now that there shouldn't be any problem. Um, in fact, somebody was telling me last night that there's a new app now in Oslo where apparently half an hour before supermarkets, bakeries and restaurants close, you can get very, very cheap deals because they have to throw stuff away. Well, okay, you know, there are ways of getting around this. You know, there are designs that you can put in there. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and this is why you've put the spiritual aspect into your work because, in, in, into this latest book of permaculture, because, you know, unless we see ourselves as all connected and, and, and as one, and that what we do to another, we do to ourselves, but just that aspect of oneness, which spirituality, spirituality does embrace um, a, a lot, it's, it's, it's one of its key, key foundations, I think, really, or key understandings of it. And, and unless we embrace that oneness, then, then, you know, uh, we we don't see ourselves as the, the same family. We see ourselves as disconnected families, separate families. We are not the same, but yet we are the same. And if we we treat each other as family, we wouldn't hopefully do some of these horrible things as 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 we do to each other. Yet families can be quite horrible sometimes. I'm not saying that, but um, you know, just the 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 whole idea of the oneness aspect. Yeah. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, actually, which is really, really important, is that um, uh, we've got to have fun doing it, too. That's really important. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's all a bit of a, a dry conversation right now in some respects. In, 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 yeah. you know, but the, the, yeah, the, the fun part there is, is, without that, there's no point doing it. Right. That's one of the things I always say in the courses, you know, if it's not fun, it's not permaculture. Um, mm. So really, I should be working on a next book, you know, permaculture <laughs> jokes, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So we're working on that one. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, I don't know if I feel like I've done this this work justice of yours, really. Um, 
Um, it was all it, part of my intention was to go through the, the, some of the different chapters in the book uh, initially in, in the interview. Um, I hope I have done it some justice. Um, it, it is a bit out of my field a little bit, so I do apologise for that. Um, but then again, it isn't when you look at the bigger picture of what permaculture is. It's common sense. It's embracing spirituality. It's trying to come up with a better way of doing things. So, it, it, you know, it all fits in, I suppose. Um, it's, um, it's different to what I thought permaculture was. Okay. Um, yeah. I could tell you a permaculture joke if you want. You know, I, don't know if you, I don't know if you take jokes on your show. Is it too go late night for that? <laughs> go ahead. No, it was too late night last night, but go ahead. <laughs> um, well, there was this permaculture uh, teacher who came to the town, uh, to a new town, and he was going to give a, a talk on permaculture at the university. And he gets into town and he asks a group of young people standing around at the station, he says, uh, can you tell me the way to the uh, university? And they say, yeah, you know, you go down there and it's right and it's left and so on. He says, great. He says, look, I'm giving a talk um, uh, about, you know, permaculture, the way of the future this evening. You might want to come. And they say, you kidding? You don't even know the way to the university. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. So that, that could be one of the beginning jokes of, of the next permaculture book. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Okay. Exactly. Um, okay. Okay. Well, um, and and now, now, now you don't have any website, do you? Because I think the only website you've got is in is in uh, your native language, Norwegian. That's right. Yep. That's right. So there is no English, English website. One, but I'm not very good at that kind of stuff. But I, I work mostly in Norway. You know. So. Of course. Of course. Do Do you get many international people attending your courses at all? Um. Yeah, not so much. I teach in Norwegian here mostly. Right, it's all n n native Norwegian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay. But I mean, I teach also in Israel and Palestine, so that's fairly international. And, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I try. Uh, I'm, my Hebrew is not very good anymore, but I do do some teaching in Hebrew. That's incredible. Uh, that's incredible. I have taught in the last few years in Latvia, Iceland. Uh, Scotland. That was all in English, of course. What What and would you? This summer, I'm going to Spitsbergen. Uh, if you don't know where that is, it's it's north of Cleethorpe. It's quite a long way. Um, it's up near the North Pole. It's like wow. Greenland. Right. Um, uh, Spitsbergen is where they have, amongst other things, um, the um, International uh, Seed Bank. Oh yes, 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 yes. Yep. So uh, I've yep. been asked to go up there and do. I, you know, I'm I'm actually quite stumped because you know we talk a lot about things like food forests and organic gardening and stuff, and I'm wondering, you know, what do you teach food forests for in a place that's thousands of kilometers north of the tree line? <laughs> yeah. Incredible, yeah. incredible. Well, well, what would you say then, Jan, is maybe the most important message of your book? Um, the most important message is that we need to feel good about living on this planet. Uh, we need to feel good about living together on this planet, all us people. And we need to feel good about living together on this planet with all the other creatures on this planet. And there actually are ways, practical, easy ways that we can start doing that. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, to buy your book, um, is it just recommended that they go to Amazon um, and, and all good bookstores to, to get hold of your uh, a copy? Um, or, or is there a sort of a, a more direct website to go to? Well, I, I googled uh, second-hand books in the United Kingdom. And I got lots and lots of online booksellers. Um, I, you can buy it through Amazon. There is absolutely no problem with that. Um, you can buy it direct from Findhorn Press. Uh, you can get it from um, Permaculture Publications. Um, and uh, uh, I think it what's it called now? Barnes and Noble. That's the one on my website. Oh yes, in the US. Is that US? I thought it was UK. 
Uh, well, uh, they're, they're from the US, but I, th- I think they're in the UK as well. But yeah, I think only US and UK. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think that's. Um... But I mean, it's easy now. Just Google the book and it comes yeah. up all over the place. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, Jan, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, it's been a pleasure to discuss um, the, 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 the very bare basics of permaculture with you. But it has been very interesting, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, we've come to an end on tonight's show. Don't forget that you can listen and watch all our past interviews on the More Shows official YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new daily shows. You may also find out more on all past and upcoming guests on the show via themoreshow.co.uk and do like us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates. So until next time, be safe.